Greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum. How you guys doing? I'm with an old friend, someone who I'm getting the chance to catch up with. Sheikh, guess who? Saad Taslim, how are you? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Long time no see. It's good to finally catch up with you again. It's always a pleasure to run into old friends, new friends, and continuing the work. You know, you're doing some wonderful work out there, and we wanted to kind of go over some because you actually we talked about your journey the last program I think it was and I actually had your brother on the show too so you're somebody who can relate to the climate the current climate the old climate all this all the things that are going on you, you came from if you haven't saw the show that I did with him it was from punk rock to Islam summary of that real quick <laughs> and you can see I will put it down in the description to actually watch that show but in, in summarizing what, what was uh, the uniqueness of your story. Punk Rock to Islam, uh, I know it's gotten a lot of attention, but really it was just about, you know, the purpose of my life and finding purpose in my life and um, music was a big part of my life. So it kind of is a, is a transition from uh, music being everything uh, to really uh, looking for spirituality and, and meaning beyond just the day to day or just, you know, trying to have, just trying to increase more fun. Right? A lot of people live their life in, in that way where their purpose of life, and I know it sounds shallow, um, people won't really admit that, but a lot of times our life just becomes about um, trying to maximize fun, you know, and that's it. And then what happens when you reach the end of your life? Like, what has that life been about? So that was really uh, my journey, which I think I'm still on this journey, and I think all Muslims were, were on this continuous journey uh, to get closer to Allah, to our Creator. Uh, and to really live for that higher purpose. I had a, a brother who reached out not too long ago and that's gonna lead into my next question. He was someone who accepted Islam, an Hispanic brother, and he said, Eddie, he said, when I was hanging out with the brothers, with you guys, I was on a different level, I kind of drifted off. He turned towards drugs, he went away from the Dean, and how what kind of advice i mean one thing is getting burnt out you yeah. can say yeah. and then you can see the ramifications of what happens on one end you're practicing the dean and you're on a different level you, you we all got ups and downs it happens that's life but then we see what happens things don't get better when you start going away from the creator from allah things as in this example things just get far worse so how can you prevent something like that happening from a getting burnt out and at the same time, when you start getting tempted, Shaitan's like, come over here. It's like the grass is greener on the other side. And then you go and sometimes you don't come back. Yeah, look, I mean, that's a, that's a common issue, right? I'm glad you brought it up because people don't really talk about this. You know, the whole burnout effect where, you know, when, when a person first accepts Islam or they first start practicing Islam, what happens is there's a rush of email, right? Or somebody's been living their life away from their fitrah. Our fitrah is our natural inclination towards goodness and towards spirituality, towards Allah. And then you know you live a whole life like that, and then finally you take your shahada, you 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 know you ex you submit to Allah, and it feels amazing because now your soul is finally clicks in, and we're flooded with iman, which is great. And then in those in those beginning days and months, you know we need that rush of iman. Uh, to deal with all the changes that we're going through but the problem is when you know we're doing everything hundred and ten percent and we look at you know sometimes there's this notion of uh, you know we look at different issues and we always we just automatically feel that maybe the the most difficult opinion has to be the most correct and when we do that and we do that for a while and we just that's that's it and our, our life just becomes you know that one track and we don't find balance, and we don't lead a balanced life, uh, it can become too much for us. And then, as you said, you know, the shaitan doesn't take you from there to, hey, let's find some balance. The shaitan takes you from there to, oh, you know what? It, maybe this whole thing is wrong. Maybe this whole religion thing is not for you. Uh, maybe this whole Islam thing is not for you. And actually, interestingly enough, Imam Ibn al-Qayyim actually talked about this phenomenon. He talked about how the shaitan, he's happy in two scenarios when Allah commands something the shaitan will take one of two stances either excessiveness going too far doing too much because he knows that he's gonna 
burn out. It's going to be too much. But when that burnout happens, the shaitan, the other thing he will pull towards, if not excessiveness, it's negligence right? and shortcoming. So that's why, that's, that's the pull. So initially there's a pull of, you know what, just go out, just do, just do everything, you know, as, as much as you can, and this and that, and that, that's all our life is about. And then the next pull is, oh, you know what? You're not finding that satisfaction. You're not finding that peace. And then we go to the other end, which is leaving it all together. And the problem is this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with needs. Our biggest and most important need is our spiritual need. Right? The need to worship Allah, the need to be spiritual beings. But it doesn't mean that we don't have other needs. For example, we have the need to be social beings. We have the need, and a lot of you know, religious people don't like this, to hear this, but we have the need to have fun and to relax, to rest, to have a good time. Right? But within, obviously, the parameters of Islam. But if we completely cut out that need, and right, we don't make time for that, then we're not fulfilling that need. And anytime you don't fulfill a need, eventually the nafs begins to feel it. Just like, you know, our spiritual needs, if we never fulfill them, we're just living dunya, 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 that's it. Then eventually our soul is going to be like, ah, something's wrong. We need to fulfill that need. Likewise, if our life becomes only about, hey, I just got to worship, worship, and this, and that, like, that's it. And there's no room for the dunya, then our nafs feels that as well. And that's why... The Prophet ﷺ, in his sunnah, we find examples of this. We've, we know those three, three people who came, Prophet ﷺ, came to his house, came to ask about his worship. And, uh, you know, they ask, uh, is Nairba Anas, who is the uh, companion who would, you know, serve Prophet ﷺ. He knew the Prophet's life inside out. So they ask him about the Prophet's worship, and these three guys, they, Anas is like, you know, they weren't really impressed by the Prophet. SubhanAllah. So one of them, he says, you know, uh, okay, well, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, he's had his past and future sins forgiven. We're not at that level, so we need to do more. Right? This is what they're trying to say. So one of them, he says, I am going to fast every single day. Another one, he says, I am going to pray the whole night. Another person, he says, I'm never going to get married. Right? And then the Prophet ﷺ hears about this, and he calls them back. And he says, did you make these statements? And they said, yes. And he says, Wallahi inni la akhshakum lillah wa atqaakum lillah. He says, I swear by Allah, I have the most piety amongst all of you. And I'm your example. Yet, I fast, and I don't fast. I don't fast every single day. And I pray, and I sleep, and I get married. Right? So here, and then he said, Man raghiba an sunnati falaysa minni, the one who goes outside of my sunnah, seeks something beyond my sunnah, and they're not from me. I mean, you can take a look at all these issues, and be like, hey, what's wrong? And we hear people say, this, hey, what's wrong with fasting? What's wrong with praying? Right? But the issue is, when it goes into an extreme that goes outside of the Sunnah of the Prophet it, it goes into, an, that, that takes us beyond what Allah knows is best for us. And that's why our spirituality begins and ends with what the Prophet has taught us. You know, sometimes people seek spirituality outside of the Sunnah of the Prophet They want to do things the Prophet didn't do, and then they're like, you know, it's, it's good though, right? I know the Prophet didn't do it like this, or he didn't do this, but I'm not doing something which is bad. Well, the problem is one of the dangers is that when we go outside of the sunnah, the Prophet said, we can get to a place where we go into an extreme, we can overwhelm ourselves. And like I said, from that point, the shaitan's not like, hey, calm down, calm down a little bit. He's like, oh, just leave it all together, right? And that's, that's really, so I'm really glad you brought this up. That's, that's the danger. So it is important that we balance our lives and we find that balance. And that balance, and you said, how can we deal with that? Well, one of the most important things is knowledge, educating ourselves. When we understand the sunnah of the Prophet we understand how he led his life, we begin to see what a balanced life looks like. Did the Prophet have fun and joke and laugh? Yes. Did he, uh, how was he with his family? Did he have rest and relaxation time with his family? And how? All of that is part of the sunnah. His behavior, how his character was with people. You know, how did he deal with people who were overtly or overly sinful was he on their case and like it's haram 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 no we have beautiful examples we have that one one guy young person comes to the Prophet he says oh messenger of Allah make it halal for me to commit zina to have sex outside of marriage right if it was one of us we would have seen that and been like astaghfirullah get out of my face you're asking me to, to say that it's okay to commit zina to have sex outside of marriage what did the Prophet do? 
he spoke to him with the best of character and he said, would you like that? Would you like that somebody commits zina with one of your female relatives? And this young man, he says, no, I wouldn't like that. I don't want to want somebody to commit zina with my, one of my female relatives. He said, Prophet said, likewise, when you commit zina, you'll be committing zina with someone's relative. That's a human being, right? That's a, that's a, that, that woman is, is, you know, related to somebody. And so now he understands, right? So Prophet spoke to him on his level with this beautiful character. That's where we find this balance. We find that balance in the life of Prophet and that comes with educating ourselves. And keeping a balance, as he was talking about, so important. And we see what happens when you go away from the submission to the Creator, not the creation of Islam. You start to drift off, hold on, hold tight, don't get burnt out. Keep a healthy balance. Tell us, Shaykh. And by the way, if you didn't know your first time listening to our brother, he went from punk rock to Islam to Medina. And he started studying, learning this deen, and now he's out there helping to share this message, this message of peace. He's acquired by submission to the will of God, living purpose, sharing purpose. But then there's out there, look, there's people, you know, when you're not getting empowered by this deen, you're getting empowered by everything else, you think superficial, materialistic, and then you're Muslim by name, right? You get emotional, like when the balloon is filled up with hot air, you just, you don't know how to intellectually tackle many of these things, and you're on the social media, and then you see someone that you really admired, for example, famous game show host, there's people like this, you ignore a lot of the trolls, but then someone who has a big following, for instance, says something like what I'm gonna repeat, maybe has really, or has, has never walked into a mosque, sat with a Muslim, so we have a great opportunity now for you to go ahead and communicate a message to this person, but also how should you deal with this? Because you see a lot of Muslims now cursing, swearing, acting opposite to the, to the Sunnah and the, the way of good character and manners. So when you see game show host Chuck Woolery. Wheel of Fortune. And now, here's your host, Chuck Woolery. Thank you, Charlie. And then someone like this offending over 1.6 billion Muslims in a statement if you don't by saying if you don't know Islam is evil then you don't know history and you refuse to reason I'm not saying every Muslim is evil different how would you what message would you have to him and what advice would you have for Muslims who are really hurt by hearing something like this Alhamdulillah I'm really glad you brought this up look I I completely understand when we hear these types of things from famous people or well-known people Islam is evil. Islam is bad. And we hear, for example, somebody on Fox News ranting about how Islam is uh, the root of terrorism and all this kind of stuff. It's easy to start to feel overwhelmed. It's easy to feel like, you know what, I just can't make a difference. You know, no matter what I say, you know, this is how people are going to view Islam and, you know, what voice do I have? You know, when somebody on TV is saying this, or somebody famous comes out and shows like this, this either hatred for Islam or, or shows this incorrect representation of Islam, it's easy to want to lose hope. And by the way, losing hope is one of the goals of the shaitan for us. He wants us to lose hope. He wants us to be like, you know what? We can't do anything. You know what? It's just that we cannot. There's nothing we can do. But remember, subhanAllah, that in the end of the day, Allah is the one who protects this deen. Allah is the one who preserves this deen. No matter what people say, in the end of the day, Allah is in charge. Allah is in control. No matter what people say. That's number one. Number two, look, the most powerful thing out there, more powerful than someone famous saying something, something being said on Fox News, even, you know, President-elect Donald Trump saying something, more powerful than that, is you and your connection with a real human being so when we sit and talk to someone they can have and i've been in situations like this speaking to someone who has all of the misconceptions all of the stereotypes about islam you know they think islam is evil and this and that and terrorism and all the long list of things but when you sit down with this person and you communicate with them and they see what a muslim looks like and they hear what a Muslim believes from the mouth of a Muslim that is more powerful than anything that happens on TV or in social media and, and, and all of that. And that's why, that's our job these days. That's what we focus on. 
is speaking to our, our, our neighbors, our coworkers, our people in school. I'm not saying, hey, you gotta preach to everybody. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is talk to them. Let them see what a, what a, what a Muslim looks like and what our, what our beliefs are, what we really believe. And I, believe, I honestly believe that once we, once, a, once someone like that actually meets a real Muslim and they start spending time with Muslims, all this other stuff won't matter. And we need to have that confidence, number one, in Islam, and number two, in our own selves as representatives of Islam. Now, if, if famous game show host Chuck Woolery, he was like, man, let me, let me sit with these guys. I want to sit, he, he, uh, he was like, I, I want to meet some of these, these Muslims who've been talking to me from the Dean show. Would you be willing? And what message would you have directly to Chuck? Okay, first of all, if you said what message do I have for Chuck, um, if he's hearing this, I would say go speak to a real Muslim and ask them and speak to them about what their beliefs are. And that would be my message to him. If I'm speaking to everybody else, I would say once again, it is important to connect with him on a real level as a human being. It's easy to get emotional. It's easy to be uh, to get aggressive with somebody who's aggressive with you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ahsan. Repel evil with that which is better. Right? Someone curses us out, it's easy to curse them out. Someone says, oh, Islam's evil, it's easy to turn around and say, no, you're a bigot, you're this, you're that, you're a racist, you don't know anything, you're just the, you know, to have this view that, that they are evil. We as Muslims, we don't look at we're the, we don't look at life in this black and white way. You're either uh, evil or good, and that's it. And everyone's defined in their role, and that's it. No one can change. How many people, Eddie, how many people do you know who went from hating Islam to not only liking Islam, to becoming Muslim? If that's not proof, then I don't know what is. Right? We, don't, we don't look at anyone and say, ah, this person is, that's it. They are enemy. We look at this person and we say, this person needs to be educated. They need to hear about the beauty of Islam. Alhamdulillah, we're coming to a close. I got one more thing I want to touch upon. You've been talking a lot of about this also. We touched upon it behind the scenes. We can bring it to fruition now. Tell me, you know, that there's, there is, you know, the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon the last and final messenger sent to mankind, who I always say he's a brother to Jesus, Moses, Abraham. They all brought that same message of Islam, submission to the Creator, not the creation. He said, I have not been sent except to to perfect good manners, character. Sometimes we'll see, you know, there's the uniform of Islam, modesty, mimicking the best of women, Jesus' mother Mary. And sometimes you'll see people who are not in accordance with the dress code or some people that are, but then their character is not in line with, with it. Or some people that are, but then you know you have someone who will wear the the, the veil, but everything else you know uh, is, is is the jeans showing and whatnot. So how do you strike a balance there? You actually touch upon this. Many people they just don't know if they, and, and and people have that sincere of heart. They're open. They want to change. It's all about changing, making progress, climbing the spiritual ladder. So I, I believe these are the kind of things that you touch upon in your classes. What advice do you have for new Muslims? They're they're you know maybe she went from really tawdry dress. Maybe he's always wearing the baby gap shirt. Everything is showing on him too, right? But it's a complete package with Islam. But then there's some people stuck. They've been like. 10, 15 years, they're like, it's all in my heart, right? Alhamdulillah, uh, great question. And I'd say this is a great question because I'm actually gonna, I'm teaching a class on this whole topic and the topic of clothing and culture. And once again, you know, we were talking about extremism going um, all out or nothing. And unfortunately, when it comes to our clothing and our dress, sometimes we take that approach as well. Uh, there's those people who say, it doesn't matter what you wear, right? Uh, whatever the culture says you wear, you wear. You know, that's one extreme. The other extreme is no, you gotta wear this exact clothing. You gotta wear a thobe, for example, right? And they look at you, brother Eddie, to be like, hmm, he's wearing a, a tie. He's wearing a suit. That's not Muslim clothing, mm -hmm. right? And that's the other extreme. Islam gives us general guidelines, protecting our modesty, covering our aura, dressing in a dignified way. But the exact 
thing of what you have to wear, Islam does say go back to your culture as long as it fulfills those conditions. So it's important, and once again, it's about education. It's about learning about what Islam tells us about our dress and clothing. What does it mean to, to dress in a dignified way? What does that mean? So once again, it's easy to get caught up in one or the other. Like you said, there's people who are like, oh, all that matters is what's in the heart. You know, Prophet said that in the body there's a morsel of flesh. If it is sound, the rest of the body will be sound as well. And he said, most certainly, that is the heart. He said, if it's ruined, the rest of the body will be ruined as well. So in the end of the day, our exterior is a reflection of our interior. So if the heart is trying to purify itself, we should try to purify our exterior as well. We should try and dress in the way, as we said, which is Islamically the most dignified. Right? And it's not one or the other. It's not just the heart or just the outside. We are in a constant struggle as Muslims to purify our hearts and purify our exterior as well. That's why, look, even our worship, our worship isn't perfect. Does that mean we leave it all together? No. We try our best and we continue to try. We continue to struggle. We continue to try to be better and closer to Allah in our hearts and our exterior. Whether it's our dress, whether it's our behavior, whether it's our worship. Allah didn't make us perfect beings. We're all struggling. The point is that we keep struggling. The point is that we keep submitting. Submitting is not a one-time deal, Eddie. You know this. Submitting is a daily action. It's an hourly action. It's a moment-to-moment -moment action that we submit. right? And the shaitan will come to you and tell you, hey, what's the point? You're not perfect. What's the point? You don't fit this category, that category. And it's easy to want to give up, to lose hope. But what matters is that we, that we keep striving and keep struggling, keep educating ourselves and keep acting upon that knowledge. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us all the strength to persevere and to continue and to live this life of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bringing us peace in our hearts and, our, and on our, in our lifestyle as well. Jesus did it, Moses did it, Abraham did it, the last and final messenger did it. Live this beautiful way of life. Direct connection with the creator of the heavens and earth. Islam, shit. Tell us. How can people hook up with you, get in touch with you? You got a website, you got a Twitter, what do you got? So people can connect with you. And maybe Chuck, Chuck can also connect. Hey look, uh, I'll make it easy for you. Any social media site you can think of, I'm on it, I believe. Most media, so I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Snapchat. Um, just look for Saad Taslim, S-A-A-D-T-A-S-L-E-E-M. Um, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, you can connect with me on there, inshallah. And I look forward to hearing from you, actually. So if you're online, tweet at me. Um, and, you know, if you're Instagram, whatever, I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. It's always an honor, always a pleasure. Pleasure is all Thank mine. you for being with us here on the Dean Show. Here. Responsibly. Use it responsibly. The social media tools. Every week, Fridays, we release a new show. God willing, inshallah, connect with us. Subscribe if you haven't already. Chuck, get with us. The message is coming to you. It's out of love, Chuck. We got love for you and all of mankind. Islam, look, look, look. Islam says love all of mankind. That's why we're delivering this message. This message of peace. Peace acquired by submission to the rule of God. I'll see you next time, inshallah. Until then, peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum. This is